Hello, everybody. My name is Jamie with LRT Sports, and with me today is Donna Lopiano. Donna is a special guest, not only because of all she's accomplished in the world of college sports, but also because of all of the projects that she's helped us work on at LRT Sports through her involvement with the Drake at LRT Sports. Through her involvement with the Drake Group, she's helped us host webinars on race issues in college athletics and general issues with the NCAA and updates with name, image, and likeness and so much more. So thank you for being with us today, Donna. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, okay, so you have a list of accolades so long that I couldn't even mention them all in so the introduction. You so you <laughs> Okay, so we'll just we'll just get into them with our questions as we go. Okay. So I read that you were a Title IX advocate or representative for a little while. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what Title IX means to you as a female athlete and as an athlete in general? Well, I, I grew up and went to school before Title IX. You can tell by my gray hair, right? <laughs> Um, but, but seriously, Title IX wasn't passed until 1972, and it was never an athletics law. It was originally targeting the fact that there were quotas on the number of women, uh, for your audience, the number of their grandmothers who were not allowed to become doctors or lawyers or um, to engage in the professions, engineers, and these were the most... Um, lucrative paying jobs uh, and um, people uh, didn't let women in, higher education institutions didn't let women in because they're afraid, oh, we're gonna waste this degree. You know, she's gonna get married, she's gonna have children, she's not gonna, she's gonna drop out of the workforce. It was really pretty sad, <laughs> um, something we'd laugh at today. But that's why Title IX passed. And one day in 1974, the National Collegiate Athletic Association um, asked their legal uh, counsel residing in Washington, DC to query Congress and to say, uh, or, or to ask, hey, does Title IX, this equal treatment law, does this apply to extracurricular activities? And the answer was, absolutely. And they said, well, like athletics? And the answer was, absolutely. And all hell broke loose. <laughs> the, the media all across the country, you could see headlines, Title IX and um, women's sports uh, are going to be the death of big time football. Oh uh, if we give women the chance to play, it's going to draw all this money away from uh, from men's sports, and somehow men are going to lose. And it's been 50 years since Title IX passed, right? Men have not lost. No. <laughs> <And> <laughs> this, is, this is what people don't understand, that whenever you have give new rights um, and new freedoms to people, it grows the pie. It doesn't make it smaller. Um, and that's the beauty of capitalism. So in you know, 1972, there were over 3.4 million boys who played high school sports and about 275,000 girls, right? If you can imagine. That's today, crazy. Today, there are over four and a half million men, boys who are playing high school sports. And there are a little over 3 million girls who are playing high school sports. So girls still aren't giving, uh, getting equal opportunity um, in sports. But the point is uh, that don't let anybody tell you that opportunity is a zero sum game, that someone is going to lose if you give opportunities to someone else. Uh, really, the pie grows. So I happened to be around during that period of time. I was a... Um, an assistant professor at Brooklyn College and um, City University of New York. I had been an athlete. Um, I didn't even play for my schools because it was very sad what, what the women's programs were like. Um, for instance, if you played high school basketball, you might have played 
10 games a season, if you were lucky. Um, and if you played, you know, any sport, there were just a minuscule number of games. And I was a softball player who played on an outside corporately sponsored team that played a hundred games a year. So, uh, and there were rules that said, if you played for an outside team, you couldn't play for your school. And who wanted to play for their school <laughs> when you could, you know, play outside like that? So um, I was fortunate to be in a geographical area of the country where that opportunity was available to me, uh, but not to very many girls. You had to be really extraordinary as an athlete uh, to have the chance to to play in the 1960s, 1970s. Um, you know, I was an athletic administrator. I was a physical education teacher. So many women worked on making sure Title IX passed and that no one ever tried to make it weaker. And the reason we did it is because we all love sports and we know what it does to individuals to you know, improve their confidence and their self-esteem. We know that 90% of all corporate women today say, I played sports and that's where I got my confidence. That's where I mm -hmm. got my work ethic. Uh, so, you know, all of us who are working to give uh, women an equal opportunity to, to play are uh, really pleased at the numbers of, of girls and women playing today, but not, not satisfied. Okay, so you've kind of already answered this. But do you, what was your favorite part about being a Title IX advocate when you worked for the Women's Sports Foundation? Or do you have like a favorite memory? Sure. Um, one of the things you do when you're working with a, an organization like the Women's Sports Foundation, which is a national organization, um, is because you reach so many people, you really work Congress. And the opportunity to testify before Congress, to visit with uh, senators and representatives, uh, to really work uh, with government for the very first time was a great lesson. Highly recommend it uh, uh, to everyone. If you ever go to DC, you have to visit your, your Congress person and uh, for sure go there with a favorite bill and tell them they have to sponsor <laughs> it. They, they will listen to you. They they. If you're a voting constituent of somebody uh, in Congress, apps, they'll, they'll take one of their staff members and say to a staff member, would you like a tour of, of the Capitol? Uh, they'll take you around. Uh, you are an important person if you are a voter in the district of um, a member of the Senate or the House. So uh, you should try it. You'll like it. Okay. So you mentioned before that you played on an outside team, not your high school team, but when you went to college and got your education, did you play on collegiate teams or did you keep continue playing on an outside team? I, I did. I played four sports in, in college. Um, and, and again, in college, we still didn't play the same number of games. I also played on out, outside teams in college. Okay. So I played for my, my college volleyball team. I played for an outside volleyball team, a USVBA team. Um, I played for, uh, I played uh, basketball. I played field hockey. I played softball. I didn't, I didn't um, play softball for my college team because again, we weren't allowed to play in the same season uh, as an outside team. Um, but no, a college athletics was great, but this was an era where there were no athletic scholarships for women. Okay. Uh, you only played within your state. You never traveled out of state. Um, so it was a very, very different environment. So being a four sport athlete is super unusual now. What do you think are some big differences? And obviously you played less games but what do you think is a big difference from when you play college sports to like dual sport athletes now? Yeah, there's been too much of an emphasis. Um, unfortunately, an emphasis that has been created by the owners of travel teams. So here you grow up in a community, you start playing youth soccer uh, or youth basketball. And uh, you know, someone comes up to you and says, hey, you're going to be really good and says to your parents, and if you want a scholarship, you have to play this year round. You've got to, you know, you've got to pitch a ball 50,000 times or, you know, they, they make up great, you know, great numbers and things. 
and convince kids that uh, you, you've, you've got to just do one sport. And it's the worst thing that, that you can do because um, young people are more susceptible to overuse injuries. We do know that cross training, that changing sports uh, will uh, uh, put you at lower risk for injury. Uh, and these highly repetitive sports are really dangerous. Um, I was at, at the University of Texas as the director of women's athletics for 18 years, and we had every single sport uh, in our program was in the nation's top 10. We produced something like 250 Olympians, right? And I, I can remember almost every swimmer um, came to us uh, out of high school with shoulder um, problems, with, with overuse problems. And this was true in practically every sport. Um, but if you talk to a lot of the Olympic athletes, they weren't single sport athletes. They took, um, many of them took up sport pretty late in life, like 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, and just, just don't let anyone tell you that it's good for you to play a sport year round. You need a break, your body needs a break, uh, you'll, you'll be better off. And don't get into this mentality of more is better. Uh, what is better about training is that when you do practice, that that, that be a, a quality practice, not a thousand of something, mm -hmm. but you know, 200 good ones, quality um, efforts. If you're shooting a basketball, you're throwing a pitch, uh, it's more important to do something well than it is just to do numbers. And a lot of kids really miss the point on that. Yeah. So kind of shifting the gears away from your time in college, can you tell me a little bit about the company that you started, the Sports Management Resources Company, and why you started that company? Well, um, when I get, got out of school, I, I, I went on to my master's degree and my PhD. Uh, and my first job out of school was to be an assistant professor and a coach at Brooklyn College, um, where I was for about five years. Then I became an athletic director at the University of Texas at Austin for 18 years. And then I went on to be CEO um, of the Women's Sports Foundation for another 15 years. Uh, at the end of that time, um, I, I said to myself, I've done kind of everything there was to do administratively. I think I'll um, be a consultant. Uh, and you have to be old and wise in order to be a consultant. <laughs> so I was around you know, long enough, people know you and how good you are. And at that point, you could probably start up your own consulting business, which is very nice because you can work at home in your pajamas and just travel when you want to. Um, and so in 2008, when I left the Women's Sports Foundation, it's exactly what I did. Um, I, I started Sports Management Resources. And uh, like every other job I've ever had, it, it was absolutely fascinating. Um, I did things that I never thought I would do. Um, one of my first jobs was to spend almost two years in uh, Qatar, in the Middle East, um, helping the son, the, the oldest son of the emir of, of Qatar, Qatar, start a sports school uh, for seventh to twelfth grade boys. Um, but being immersed in uh, another culture, in uh, another setting, to, um, you know, realize how how similar people are, but how different people are, um, was the experience of a lifetime. So um, it, I, I think the audience here is, is the first generation that will grow up in a global economy. Uh, no longer are people saying, oh, I wanna work for the NBA, or I wanna be a college coach. They're saying, I wanna play for uh, a pro team in Japan. I want to work in marketing uh, or for ESPN in Europe. Um, and if you get the chance to uh, travel abroad and to be immersed in another uh, culture, you'll find that one of the most fascinating um, you know, things you'll ever do. And it'll make you really appreciate the United States. 
That's awesome. So were there any challenges that you faced running a company in a male dominated industry? Oh, there are plenty. Um, there are plenty today. And um, back in the 1970s, when everyone was mad at women's athletics because, you know, there were these, the fake news was that, yeah, you know, yeah. men's football was going to die. Come on. Right? And the thing you have to remember <laughs> is that none of it's personal, right? People aren't, you know, attacking you. It's that they're either scared or they're stupid or, <laughs> or it, it just doesn't make sense when you think mm -hmm. about it. Um, so I think that helps realizing it's not personal. Uh, I think making sure you never get angry at someone. Um, you know, when you get angry at someone or burn a bridge, uh, you know, chances are the creek's going to rise when you need that person the most. Do not, do not burn a bridge. Um, and uh, just being, you know, nice to people and talking rationally to, to people and having facts and it, it, being successful in life after sport is exactly like sport. And what made uh, what made us good as athletes makes us great as people who work in corporations or businesses or nonprofits. Because as athletes, what did we do? You went into the game, and even when you lost, right? Was it upsetting eh, for a second? But you went back, you said, what did I do wrong? I gotta fix this. You trained again, and you went right back out and played until you win, right? So, so that kind of persistence, that, um, that kind of you know, self-examination, you know, figuring out how come I didn't win this thing that I wanted to do, uh, that really has carryover. Um, and if you spend as, as much time preparing for meetings as you did training for a sport, you're going to be great at whatever you do. That's an awesome answer. I feel like if I put as much time into anything as I did when I was playing sports, it would make such a huge difference. Absolutely. It, it's, it's how much, you know, the difference between good and great is attention to detail. What does mm -hmm. that mean? That means you really got into got to get into your sport or your business so that you know as much as you possibly can. Um, and to think that I'm going to go out into the world and now, you know, I somehow I'm going to drink something and be good at something. <laughs> it doesn't it no. doesn't happen that way. You have to completely immerse yourself in this new space, and you've got to understand it. You've um, you've got to put the same effort as you put into sport into it. That's awesome. So moving on, I read that you were named one of the top 10 most powerful women in sports. Can you tell me how you felt when you earned that title? And if there was like a specific moment or something that you think contributed to that? Uh, no specific moment. Um, I think that was a function of um, being in my profession for as long as I was and being um, playing a leadership role in, in everything from testifying before Congress to standing up at a something like an NCA convention and saying, look, this is the right thing to do or this is the wrong thing to do. When you're a, a person who speaks truth who does their homework, who um, um, really steps up when something wrong is happening, you become really powerful uh, because just think about it, the people who are silent, people view that they're pushovers or you know, they're not gonna do anything. Um, when, and, and this doesn't mean you're yelling, but when you um, either in writing or orally, um, take a position in favor or against something, and you're there every day saying the right thing, uh, people listen, and they're also um, fearful of you and your power. They think you have power. Uh, and that's because knowledge is power. Uh, being able to, you know, convince others uh, to do something 
because you have the facts in front of you, or this is the right thing to do, that is being truly powerful. Awesome. So moving from that, I'm going to go on to our last question. I think you've offered some really good advice so far. So if you have nothing else to add, that's okay. <laughs> but my last question for you is going to be, do you have any more advice for young female athletes who are either trying to make their way in sports that girls are still told are boys only sports or just women in general who are trying to make their way in the sports industry? Well, the sports industry is still predominantly male. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you know, people talk a little bit about finding mentors. Uh, I think it's important for people to understand that there's no such thing as a single mentor. Um, if you can put yourself so that you're in a position, an internship or working for, you know, someone who has influence in the in industry, um, then everyone you work for, everyone you touch will, will give you something, some knowledge, something you're learning and will become an ally and a mentor, somebody who's going to help you take the next step. Um, but you have to be, um, you have to be a relationship person. You have to be curious. You don't have to be, um, uh, you know, people say, what is a good relationship builder? I, I've always said that the most important thing I ever learned uh, when meeting new people was to the first question um, in meeting someone is, hey, did you ever play sports? And then all of a sudden they come alive Mm -hmm. And even if they just played intramural basketball in high school, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, I was a basketball player. <laughs> right? But it breaks the ice. Mm -hmm. It establishes a, a point of connection, a, a point of mutual interest. It's not threatening. It has gets somebody to talk ab about themselves. Um, and that, to me, is, is probably... The most valuable uh, thing I've ever earned because it's amazing how after people talk about themselves they think you're a really good person you know <laughs> it's like boy she was really nice you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know how does that happen but you know that's true right yeah yeah, yeah. that's awesome I'll have to try that next time I meet somebody really <laughs> oh, it's, it's, and you know it's, it, it, it was always disappointing to me when I went into a corporate meeting for instance and there were women around the table the guys, even if they played intramural in high school, would say, I'm an athlete, right? The women would say, no, 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 I, I was never an athlete. And I said, well, do you work out? Do you, and they would say, well, I, I've done two marathons or you know, I run five miles a day or they think an athlete is something like professional, mm. not just playing sports. and. Um, that always fascinated me that that women uh, minimized their uh, physical talents in in many ways, did not put it in the same uh, level of importance as as boys mm -hmm. and men's, men do. Um, and and yet we see the data, right? All of these successful women today say, "I was an athlete." And I was talking to um, a U.S. representative uh, a couple of weeks back. Uh, named Lori Trahan from um, from Massachusetts, and she was a volleyball player in in um, in college, and credits that with her being successful, like all of us who played sports, right? Mm -hmm. um, the world, especially the capitalist society, is very competitive. So the best training in the whole world for corporate competition is team sports. Uh, or individual sports, but competing in those sports. So mm -hmm. um, you get a leg up when you play sports. That was just a perfect way to end. So thank you. 